So anatomically, we can really divide the airways into two parts. That which is above the level of the larynx, up here, and now which is below the level of the larynx, down here. And anything above the level of the larynx, we can call that the upper airway. So we see in the upper airway we have the nasal cavities. And of course you can include the oral cavity in that as well, really, because air does go through the oral cavity. And if I just hatch this in, you might be able to see it a bit better. Because what we've got here is the airway. So th these are the nasal cavities here. So that's clearly airway. Then it goes to that narrow bit at the back. And then what we have at the back here is this, this tube here. This tube there. And this section here is the pharynx. And the pharynx is divided into two parts. Three parts, three parts of the pharynx, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. And then this tube going down here, which we'll just hatch in in a different colour. This tube going down here is, this, this here is the esophagus. That's the food pipe going down to the stomach down there. The airway continues through this cartilaginous piece of connective tissue, the epiglottis and the airway carries on here, down here, to the lower airways. So this is, this is the way the air goes in, and then it goes, it has to take a bit of a diversion forward there to go anteriorly into the airway, because of course the trachea is anterior to the esophagus. So nasopharynx is the part behind the, the nose, just here. This is the nasopharynx. Then the part behind the mouth there, that next bit is the oropharynx, and then the lower part is the laryngopharynx, but of course that is all part of the airway. And the nose is vital because it's, it detects uh, poisonous smells. So if, the, if there's toxic gases, the nose will alert us to that. And like the rest of the upper airway, it also moistens and warms the air because we don't want cold, dry air getting down into the lower air airways to dry them out. Because as we've already seen, the cilia like 100% humidity in order to function properly. So it needs to be moistened, warmed and filtered. And of course, the, the nose, part the reason you've got hairs in your nose is because the hairs in the nose will trap larger objects. And if someone's got a tracheostomy, there's a real risk in summertime that they can inhale insects. So sometimes we put a grid on front of the tracheostomy and we call it a nose to, to protect the airway from insects. And functionally, we can divide the airway into two parts as well. So structurally, we can talk about the upper airway above the larynx and the lower airway below the larynx. But functionally, we can talk about the conducting airways. Now the conducting airways are the airways that just conduct the air to the respiratory airways, as we've seen on previous videos. So these are all really conducting airways, conducting the air ultimately down to the respiratory zone. Now the olfactory receptors are more or less about here. This is where the smell detectors are. And the olfactory detectors go directly towards the brain because the first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve, the second is the optic, the third is the oculomotor. So the, the olfactory nerve going directly into the brain there. But of course we notice that the olfactory receptors are basically neurological in nature. So really it's as if there's part of the brain projecting forward into the nasal cavities. And these are actually dividing nerve cells. And it's very interesting. Researchers have taken some of these cells from the nose and have been able to culture them because they can actually get them to divide. So that's neurological tissue dividing because presumably these go on dividing in life. It's, no, it's normal for them to undergo mitotic divisions and it's certainly been done experimentally. But what it also means is, can you see there's a bit of a pathway into the brain there, the small holes in the skull that, that allow these uh, optic, not optic, allow these olfactory nerves in, these nerves of smell in. And if there's holes there into the 
cranial cavity, which is here, because of course the brain is, this, this is the brain here, the brain's in this bit here, then there's actually a risk that bacteria can get through from the nasal cavities into the cranial cavity. And that is one of the ways that people can get meningitis as the infection can go from the nasal cavities through to the cranial cavities. And of course the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the, um, the larynx, the trachea and all the other airways are a continuous surface. There's no sort of anatomical demarcations. There can't be otherwise, otherwise the air couldn't get through. So it's a continuous surface. So part of the problem is that infection can migrate from say the upper airways into the lower airways. So an upper respiratory tract infection can become potentially a lower respiratory tract infection as well. Now the nasal cavities are lined with uh, respiratory epithelium. So all around, all around here we've got, uh, particularly back here, th th these, these are lined with respiratory epithelium. And this respiratory epithelium is called pseudostratified. So it's pseudostratified and it's uh, columnar and it's ciliated. So I've got a, a diagram of that here. Here we see it. So, what do we notice? Well, we notice it's, it's columnar, so it's column shaped, essentially. It's column shaped, it's columnar. And it's called pseudostratified. Now, a simple epithelium, like this one you get in the lower airways, a simple epithelium like that. Here we have columnar cells, dark staining nuclei. We'll see what this cell is later. It's actually what you call a goblet cell. And the goblet cells produce mucus in the airways. But that's a simple columnar epithelium. Whereas this one is, is uh, it's still simple because it's only one layer, but it's pseudostratified. And what it is, the cells are all kind of different shapes. And what this means is the individual nuclei are at different levels. It looks even more complicated when you look at a microscope. But they're all in contact with the red basement membrane. Well, red in this diagram, not red in life particularly. So all the cells are in contact with the, the basement membrane. So it's, a, it's an epithelium, it's a tissue that lines, and it's pseudostratified. It looks stratified, but it's not. Pseudo means false. And it's ciliated, we note that it's ciliated. And as well as that, from time to time in here, there's going to be an additional form of cell called a goblet cell. Now the goblet cells, here's a goblet cell. So, the goblet cell is on the basement membrane and we don't drink out of goblets anymore but you know the old-fashioned drinking goblets something like that it's like an upside down goblet and what these cells do is these goblet cells produce the mucus so the mucus is produced here by these cells goes into this area out of the neck of the goblet and lines the surface. That's what makes it a mucosa because of these goblet cells, although there are other glandular structures that we'll see later on. So it contains these goblet cells as part of its, uh, part of its structure. And we notice that it's ciliated because it contains these cilia. So it's a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium and it contains goblet cells. And under here there'll be a capillaries and a submucosa. So the mucus from the uh, from the goblet cell, the goblet cell is actually in this layer here. So let's let's just put it on. Let's imagine that's the goblet cell there, also in this layer. And the goblet cell is producing the mucus, and the mucus is going to basically form a raft on top of the cilia like this. So you get a layer of mucus on top of the cilia and of course the mucus is sticky so foreign material coming in will stick to this will stick to that like that and be wafted along with the movement of the of the cilia so the mucus traps dust traps particles traps bacteria but also moistens the air as well and protects the underlying tissues which is very important So in the nasal cavities, 
in the nasal cavities and in the nasopharynx there there is this pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium so ciliated pseudo stratified epithelium I'll just have another color all around this area here all around that area there and what they're doing is they waft this material they waft this material remember we had the recovery strokes and the power strokes like that wafting this material so these cilia are wafting waves of movement propelling the material in a particular direction always towards the pharynx so it can be coughed up and into the mouth now the lining of the um, oropharynx and the lining of the oropharynx uh, behind the mouth and the laryngopharynx is somewhat different because this portion of the airway has, has a dual purpose. It, it's airway, but it's also foodway as well, isn't it? So there's abrasion from the food there that's swallowed. So that's a slightly different type of epithelium lining that. The oropharynx transmits air and food. So it's a non-keratinized, stratified uh, squamous epithelium. Non-keratinized means it's not got keratin like, like your skin, so it's soft. And it's stratified means it's made of many layers, but it's made of many layers of flattened cells. But it's many layers of cells so it can resist the trauma of food passing through it. So a slightly different type of uh, epithelium, well very different type of epithelium really. And of course as you probably know the larynx contains the vocal cords and superior to the vocal cords, that's above the level of the vocal cords, there's a non-keratinized strati stratified squamous epithelium just above here. So that's the same type of epithelium that we get in the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. But inferior to the vocal cords in the airways, there's a return to this pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells. So the epithelium below here is going to be the same as that in the nasal cavities and the nasopharynx but all ciliated but of course the difference is that below this level here down here the cilia are wafting up the way because the aim is always to get to the oropharynx here all cilia want to get to the oropharynx just here and the reason they want to get there is because there we can spit it out or we can swallow it down into the esophagus where hopefully the bacteria will be killed by hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes in the stomach. You probably remember the main structures of the airway. We've got the trachea here and the trachea is about 12 centimetres long and it's all lined with this same pseudo stratified columnar epithelium with cilia and the goblet cells to produce the mucus. And it's interesting to note that the mucociliary clearance system under good conditions as it is propelling material in the case of the trachea propelling material up towards the pharynx as it propels material along it can move this material along at the rate of about half a centimeter per minute about half a centimeter per minute so that means the 12 centimeters of the trachea here the material could be wafted from here down near the carina up to the top of the trachea in less than 25 minutes. So this mucociliary clearance system is actually working fairly quickly, wafting this material up so it can be coughed out, preventing the stasis. And also in these ciliated cells there's going to be lots of mitochondria. Do you remember the mitochondria? These are the powerhouse of the cell with highly enfolded inner membranes and they produce lots of energy. You have a large internal surface area. Lots of mitochondria in these cells producing energy, converting ADP to ATP, the adenosine triphosphate, that is the energy currency of the cell.
using metabolic substrates such as fatty acids and glucose, metabolizing those in the presence of oxygen to produce energy and waste carbon dioxide and water. Now in the larger airways, as well as the uh, goblet cells that we've talked about producing mucus, there's actually larger submucosal mucus producing cells as well. So again, I'm just pinching the diagram from the, uh, from the physiology book. So what we have here is this is on a smaller scale of magnification. So here we have the cells, the pseudo, pseudo stratified columnar ciliated epithelium. And you can see the tiny cilia on there, the hair like structures. And, and here we have the, uh, the submucosa. So th th this layer, so it's the mucosa on top, the mucous membrane. And then this layer here is the submucosa. And as you know, in the larger airways, there's cartilage in the, the, outer, in the outer part of the adventitia. So there's the submucosa. And we see that mucous glands dip into the submucosa. And these are going to be multicellular glands. So if we look at one of these glands in larger magnification like this, we'd see that there's many mucus producing cells in their walls that are producing the mucus. The walls are all going to be lined with these mucus producing cells. Producing relatively large amounts of mucus into here, going up, out of here, which in case of here goes here and it's going to line the surface of the airways with mucus. This is part of the problem in chronic bronchitis. You get enlargement of these, great enlargement of these glands. And that means there's huge amounts of mucus produced. And as well as that, because the glands are enlarged, they start pushing in and narrowing the airways, part of the reason it's a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And of course, in cystic fibrosis, mucoviscidosis, this, this is too thick. All of the body's producing mucus that's too thick. So the mucus can no longer be effectively moved by the cilia because it's of the wrong viscosity. The cilia can still work, but the mucus is just too thick to have the mucociliary clearance mechanism working as we would hope. So going further down into the airways, the main bronchi still have this type of pseudo stratified columnar epithelium with the nuclei at different, uh, different levels here. So it's still the pseudo stratified ciliated epithelium. Um, so same, same with the second level bronchi, the lower bronchi, and same with the tertiary segmental bronchi supplying the bronchopulmonary segments. It's all this type of epithelium here. And then the airways, of course, break down into the bronchioles, and there's many branches to the terminal bronchioles. So we're getting down to the level of the small airways now. But in the level of the small airways, there's a switch to ciliated simple columnar epithelium. So now we're in the smaller bronchial passages, we have this type of uh, ciliated epithelium. So they've still got the cilia. The cilia are still there, but the cells are a bit tidier and a bit more regular now in the smaller airways. And, they, and these often have smaller numbers of cilia than there were in the uh, pseudo stratified uh, epithelium. Uh, less goblet cells as well. But in these areas, in the smaller airways, there's patrol of macrophages. So macrophages are these very large cells. So macrophages are large cells. They're a type of white blood cell, really, but, but they stay in the tissues and they patrol the tissues. They derive from monocytes in the blood. And if they come across any bacteria or indeed foreign particles, they will phagocytose them. They will eat them thereby keeping the airways sterile and the lungs are essentially sterile. And about this time where there's the switch to the simple columnar epithelium as well, there's loss of cartilage in the rings. And these are airways that are round about probably less than two millimeters in diameter. So we're in the very small airways now, the smaller bronchioles. And now we're in the smaller bronchioles. In the smaller bronchioles, where we haven't got the rings of cartilage, there's an additional defense mechanism comes into play here. 
So here we have a smaller bronchial passage breaking down into perhaps terminal bronchioles. So we have a, a bronchiole here and smaller bronchioles there. And there's going to be smooth muscle in the wall of these smaller bronchioles. They'll contain smooth muscle in the wall. Smooth muscle. And this is very important because what this means is there can be nervous innovation. Innovation by the nervous system. So I'm going to use two colours here. We'll use a green, I think, to illustrate innovation from the sympathetic nervous system. So there can be sympathetic innovation of the bronchial smooth muscles. Now, if the sympathetic innovation of the bronchial smooth muscles, what is that going to do to bronchial tone? Well, the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight nervous system. So if we're fighting or flighting, do we need more or less air to get down into the smaller airways and the respiratory airways? Well, clearly we need more. So sympathetic stimulation is going to cause bronchodilation. So sympathetic stimulation results in bronchodilation. This is the way sorbutamol works. It stimulates the sympathetic fibres, sti stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and causes bronchodilation, which of course is exactly what we want to reverse the bronchoconstriction associated with asthma. But there's other autonomic neurological innovation of these airways as well, here drawn in blue, and this represents parasympathetic innovation. Now the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest nervous system. So what the parasympathetic fibres will do, stimulation from the parasympathetic fibres will cause bronchoconstriction. That will narrow the bronchial passages down. Now you might ask, well, why don't we just leave the bronchial passages dilated all the time so we can get as much air in and out as possible? Well, the problem there is when the airways are very dilated, then more bacteria can get in and we don't want bacteria to get in. So when we don't need the airways to be dilated, it actually makes physiological sense to have them as constricted as possible to let as little foreign bodies and we don't want uh, bacteria and things getting down into the lower airways. So, so both the sympathetic stimulation during fight and flight and the parasympathetic stimulation during rest and digest both make perfect sense. And you might have given a bronchodilator called ipotropium bromide, which is anticholinergic, because these nerve fibres work on, the, the parasympathetic nerve fibres work on the transmitter of acetylcholine. So if we inhibit the activity of acetylcholine with ipotropium bromide and other similar uh, bronchodilators, if we're inhibiting the parasympathetic, if we're inhibiting the parasympathetic, then can you see we're inhibiting that which brings about constriction? So reducing the activity of the parasympathetic will allow for bronchodilation. Pharmacologically, we can bring about bronchodilation in two ways. We can stimulate the sympathetic, which naturally brings about bronchodilation, or we can inhibit, inhibit the activity of the parasympathetic, which normally brings about bronchoconstriction. If we're inhibiting the bronchoconstriction, that will allow for bronchodilation as well. Now, when we get down to the level of the respiratory bronchioles, so as you remember, we have a, a bronchiole here, and this is going to divide into a, a terminal bronchioles. So that's a small bronchiole, and it's divided into terminal bronchioles. And these are going to further subdivide into respiratory bronchioles. So these are the respiratory bronchioles with the alveoli in their walls. So we have a bronchiole there, terminal bronchiole there, respiratory bronchioles here, and the respiratory bronchioles are going to break down further into the alveolar ducts. Into the alveolar ducts here. And the alveolar ducts are going to lead into the alveolar ducts 
air sacs with their huge uh, internal surface area. Like this. And of course what we've actually drawn here is essentially a uh, what we've drawn here is a pulmonary lobule. So that this would be a pulmonary lobule here with uh, elastic tissue in the walls. Pulmonary lobule. And of course going into the pulmonary lobule you'll be all would have a, a branch of the pulmonary artery taking in deoxygenated blood to the alveoli. We'd have a branch of the pulmonary vein taking oxygenated blood out draining the pulmonary vein to go back to the left side of the heart and we'd also have a lymphatic vessel draining this as well. Now what happens is there's a switch at the level of the respiratory bronchioles here and, and the switch is that the simple cuboidal epithelium here changes to a simple squamous epithelium and the squamous epithelium is a very flattened epithelium it's like this because the cuboidal cells would now take too much space so if that's the basement membrane there then these cells are just going to be much flatter uh, much flatter shape like this with a nuclei there like that so that would be the sort of epithelium from the level of the respiratory bronchioles down and of course this is essential that these are thin to allow the exchange of gases through the wall. So in the respiratory bronchioles we couldn't have nigh, sort of big thick tall cells like that because the distance for gaseous exchange would be too great. We need a much thinner wall. But let's just go back and think a little more about these amazing cilia that we've been talking about. So what happens is there's like a raft of mucus on top of these cilia, as we've said, that's propelled by, by, the, by the cilia, propelling material along, in the case of the airways, up towards the trachea, to go up towards the oropharynx. And the cilia, we know that they're wafting like this with their power strokes and their recovery strokes, wafting the material along. But the whole array is, is coordinated in waves. It's a bit like these so-called Hawaiian waves that you might see at football matches or something. There's waves of, uh, of activity, sometimes called metachronal waves, of metachronal waves of activity, coordinating the contraction of the cilia. And the cilia are actually quite long and thin. Typically in the respiratory system, the cilia are about seven micrometers in length. That's about the same as the diameter of a red blood cell. And typically they're about one micrometer in diameter. So they're actually quite long and thin structures. And actually we've drawn a layer of mucus on top there, but there's also a second type of thinner mucus, which is kind of underneath here, which aids and lubricates the transmission of the top layer of mucus or to promote the motility of the mucociliary clearance system and its effectiveness at wafting this material out at the rate of about five millimetres per minute. And as we've mentioned, there's lots of mitochondria in here producing all the energy that's required for the movement of these cilia. So we have quite an amazing mucociliary clearance system wafting all this mucus. But I think I'll just say one more thing before I finish and that's related to coughing. So it's all very well getting the mucus as the mucociliary clearance system will from the smaller airways to the bigger area air, airways and it will get it to the trachea. So the mucus via the mucociliary clearance system will be wafted to the trachea from the lower airways. But that means we accumulate lots of mucus in the trachea. Now there's a bit of a problem here because we've got this cartilaginous structure in the way, the larynx. So we need to cough, <coughs> clear our throats, <coughs> to get the mucus, 
that's been wafted there by the mucociliary clearance system up to the oropharynx where we can swallow it or spit it out. So if a patient can't cough, what that means is the mucus is going to accumulate here in the trachea and we won't be able to get it with this blast of air. A cough is a suddenly released blast of air that wafts them, not wafts, but physically propels the mucus through the larynx into the oropharynx. So if your patient can't cough, that is going to stay there and the bacteria in this mucus are going to go back down into the lower airways. And a patient who can't cough or clear their throat effectively will get a severe chest infection. They will get pneumonia and that's a life threatening condition. So make sure your patients can cough. If they're paralyzed, then sometimes you need to suck them out with a, with a tracheostomy, with a tracheostomy for, for a period of time. If the patient doesn't want to cough because they've got pain in the ribs, then give them analgesics to cover that. But you've got to make sure your patients can cough because all of this amazing mucociliary clearance system is designed to get the mucus to the oropharynx where it can be coughed out or swallowed.